Well, hello, everybody. My name is Elena G. Levine. I'm president of Quantum Success Solutions, and I'm the author of the forthcoming book, Networking for Nerds, which is being published by Wiley and will be out in June. I'm delighted and excited today to present to you this webinar. I'm about to graduate. What on earth do I do now? 10 plus things that you can do literally now, and I do mean literally, to get a job. So before we get into this, I just want to thank our supporters and our sponsors today of this webinar. This is being presented by the AIP Career Network, and you can see um, many of the organizations that put together and are part of that AIP Career Network down at the bottom of your screen. A couple of quick housekeeping issues. If for some reason you can't see, you can simply adjust your viewer. If you can't hear me at some point in the a webinar, simply log out and log back in. And if you have any questions at all during the webinar itself, there's a question part of your console off to, your, off to the right. Simply just type in your questions. And at the end, I'm going to take a few questions and we can, uh, we can address whatever it is that you're interested in. So let's go ahead and get started. I'm about to graduate. What on earth do I do now? So what, do our, what are our goals for today? Very simply, our goals today are going to be to get you a freaking job, okay? That's our plan, and I'm going to show you how we're going to do it. Okay, step one, don't panic. I know you're about to graduate, and maybe you literally are about to graduate, like within a week or two, and you still haven't gotten a job, but I don't want you to panic because I want you to recognize, first of all, that you are desired by many, many different industries. In fact, the skills that you've gained studying physics, studying science, studying STEM in general, are very coveted by many, many different sectors. They actually look at this as a, as a great platform for you to actually get uh, and produce really terrific value for their organizations. I found this having graduated with my math degree, Intel Corporation had recruited me just because of my math degree, and it wasn't even for a technical position. They wanted me with a math degree. They recognized that that just by itself meant that I was smart. And that just goes to show you that having studied STEM and, and more particular physical sciences, you actually can build a platform upon that. So what we're going to do in terms of finding a job for ourselves is we're going to approach this quote-unquote problem, this challenge, with our superior STEM capabilities specifically our ability to solve problems in multiple ecosystems. That's something that we innately get from studying STEM, and that's something that is unique to STEM. We are natural problem solvers, and since every job is going to require you to solve problems, this gives you an advantage. But what you really need to do in terms of preparing to get a job, to find a job, to search for a job, is to be entrepreneurial. Look for solutions where other people only see problems. And here's the metaphor for you. There's a wall in front of you. Other people walk by the wall. They don't even notice the wall. They don't even think that there might be something on the other side of the wall. They just walk by the wall. Or maybe they realize that there is a barrier there, but they can't figure out how they could potentially get on the other side. But you, being an entrepreneur, being innovative in your problem solving, you're already looking at solutions. So instead of seeing a wall as a barrier or as a cloak to prevent you from seeing what's on the other side, you see a wall as a potential pathway you see a wall that could be broken down. You see a wall that could be, uh, a door could be installed or a crack or a window. You see a wall that could be completely demolished and then the, the waste products could be recycled into something else. That's something that's also very unique to your experience, to your education. Being able to see solutions where other people see problems or don't even see anything at all. So we're going to be entrepreneurial in the way we look for jobs, just in the same way we look for solutions in science too. And I want you to also be very patient because your dream job, or I like to call it your astronaut job, right, that job that is truly your dream that you would like to do, your dream job or your dream field is out there. It might not be that your first job out of, your, out of college or after you finish your, your graduate degree or after you finish your first postdoc is your dream job, but it can lead you to your dream job. And that's what we're going to do in terms of thinking also. We're going to allow our, our first job that we get as a way, as a platform to get to our dream job down the road. That's also very entrepreneurially in thinking. Uh, now, the other thing is, in terms of not panicking, we have to do a financial self-assessment. So we need to know, because we're planners, we're problem solvers, we need to plan ahead of time and see what exactly, what it is that we've done 
and what it is that we would need to do if we were going to get a job now, would we be able to, you know, or get a job in three months, would we be able to wait for a few months, would we be able to wait for six months? How long can I go without a job? So this is very important for you to be thinking about now. So you do that financial self-assessment so that you can see exactly how much money you have in the bank. And if that's if it's not the case that you can't go more than X number of months or X number of weeks, then it might be that you have to take an interim job. Um, and maybe that interim job might be right at the institution that you're already in. It might be in the city or the town that you're in. Uh, maybe it might be in the form of a short-term project. Perhaps you could go back to your PI or your advisor and say, do you have a suggestion? But the bottom line is that while you're not panicking, you're also being as clear-minded as you possibly can about how much money you have that would support you in the case of you not finding that first really great job that you want. So if you don't get a job in your field, what are your contingency plans? And a lot of people don't think to make a contingency plan. They just go straight towards their eye. Their eye is on the prize, and that's important. Your eye should be on the prize of that dream job, that astronaut job. But just in case you don't become an astronaut in three weeks, we need to have a contingency plan ready to go, whereby maybe we might take a short-term project, maybe we might take a job that's completely outside of our field just to build up capacity, you know, financial capacity, so that we can continue looking for the type of position that we want. That's reality, and that's a really important step that you can take, and it also will give you confidence, because it'll allow you to see exactly where you should be and where you can be in your job search process. So step two, is know what you can and what you want to do. And the idea here is I want to identify for myself what skills do I have that I really enjoy using. When you think about it this way, and this is actually how I addressed and I approached my first job search process, my first job search when I graduated with my degree, you know, I didn't think in terms of actual job titles. I thought of where would be an interesting playground for me to play in. Where would be an interesting sandbox? Where would be an interesting place that I could find these types of toys that I could play with? And of course, the toys that I was thinking of were skills that I used as a math major and as a leader in like the Society of Physics students and other clubs. And I just thought of what do I enjoy doing? What skills do I enjoy using? What tasks do I enjoy doing? What kinds of toolbox or what kinds of playgrounds do I enjoy playing in? And in that case, it actually never, like when I looked for my jobs, I never really thought of them as a job, quote unquote, as a job. I just looked at them as an extension of me playing. And that actually helped me find the path that I was in, am in today and helped me set the, the foundation for the path that I'm in today and helped me get to where I am today, which is very important because it is something that I enjoy doing. So you start with what you love. You may not even know what the title is of the skill. You just know that you enjoy using this particular instrument or you use like, like using this particular type of thinking. And maybe it's a nonlinear type of thinking that you use. I know from studying mathematics and physics that I am a very much a nonlinear thinker. And I really enjoy doing that, like a chess match, right? I think about things seven moves ahead. I, ha I think in terms of um, branching probability streams, decision trees, to quote Elon Musk. You know, that's how I think, and that's actually something that I enjoy doing, which is how I was able to build my career in communications, science communications, and in other areas, because I started thinking that way, and I started looking for opportunities where I could play in that playground, where I could use that skill in a playground. So what we're going to do is we're going to identify what our career goals are and our needs are. And that's very important to differentiate between our goals, our wants, and our needs. We can start from the very high level, from the amorphous sort of level, and this is where you think, I really want to lead a team, I really like working in academia, or I want to do research, or I want to teach. It could be a little bit more focused. Maybe I want to work with lasers. They are the coolest things. I want to work with lasers no matter what. Maybe it's even more specific. I want to code in Python, or I want to do something that combines physics and cancer research. Maybe you have ideas as to where you would like to do your job, where you would like to pursue a job, maybe certain ecosystems such as academia or industry or maybe in a nonprofit environment or a government lab or a government agency. Maybe you're very nimble and very quick and very flexible, so you are thinking about the startup environment, working for a startup company. Maybe you have very specific sectors in mind that might be fun for you, such, the, such as an oil and gas, the oil and gas sector or a communication sector or 
working in for a museum or working for a, uh, a research lab uh, that's a nonprofit lab or a non-governmental organization. You might also have some ideas as to where in the world you physically want to be. Maybe you want to be in New Jersey. Maybe you want to be in Japan or Western Europe or wherever. Maybe you actually like your partner. You, some people do. <laughs> they actually like their spouse, their partner, and they actually want or maybe even need to be within a certain distance from their partner when, when you are both deciding about what jobs you're going to pursue. So maybe you need or want to be within two hours of where your partner is working. This is an important thing to be thinking about because you want to identify what your goals, your wants, and your needs are so that you can start thinking about where you should be looking for jobs and what type of opportunities you should be looking for. Now this skill inventory matrix is something I'm going to send to you. Uh, this is a private document that will help you start thinking about how talented you are and the extent of your value and the extent of all of the skills and expertise that you have. This, again, it's a private document. You don't have to show this to your mommy or daddy, and you certainly don't have to show this to your advisor or your PI. This is for you and you alone to chart your path. So we start on the left-hand side there, and we look at what experiences we've had. And an experience is literally anything that has given us experience. It could have been a job where we were actually paid. It could have been a volunteer experience. It could have been a short-term project. It could have been a class project. Maybe it was an internship or a TA ship or an RA ship. Maybe it was something that we did in the community. Maybe through our religious affiliation or religious organization. Or maybe it was as president of the, you know, uh, the, the football team in the community. Uh, anything like that. And we track it back. We list all of the experiences going back as far as we can remember, to including to the job you had at McDonald's for two weeks before you dropped the Big Macs on the floor, you know, when you were 17 years old. So we're going to list all those down, and now what we're going to do is we're going to dissect our brains to figure out what skills and experiences and attributes we gained from those different experiences. So first of all, we look at the technical skills. So these are the, the, the skills of being a scientist or being an engineer. And in science, the science skills could include research skills, data collection and analysis skills, skills experiment design. Uh, and implementation. It could include field work skills, of course. There's the engineering side of things, the instrumentation, actually building and using instruments, machining skills, again, building things, and then your computing skills, including languages, platforms, hardware, software. What did you get? Think about it. When I did this job, when I had this short-term project, when I did this, when I was the president of this club, were there any technical skills that I gained from that experience? And then we're also going to analyze and identify that we've gained quite a few business skills. And I know this might be a shock to some of you out there, especially with the physical sciences and the STEM degree, that, wow, I didn't realize I had business skills. Yes, you do. You have some amazing business skills. And when I say amazing, I mean they are skills that are coveted by industry. They are coveted in academia. They're coveted in many, many sectors. And what's great about it is that this is your chance to shine, because a lot of scientists and engineers, they don't think on their resume they don't think about on their LinkedIn profile. They don't think about in their marketing documents for looking for jobs to identify and highlight their business skills. But now that you know that you have these and you have your science and technical skills as well, you're going to highlight both, which is going to make you a more desirable candidate and give you the competitive advantage in getting a job. So these business skills here that I have listed here, these are things that you innately get from being a scientist and from studying science and engineering and technology and mathematics. So project management is the first one there because you've managed projects. They might be very small projects. They might have had a budget of $10, but they were still projects. And that's giving you experience in project management. If you have been on a grant, if you've written a grant, if you've been involved with any sort of money at all through a club, for example, you have accounting and finance experience. If you've hired somebody, if you've mentored somebody like in your lab or in your research group, if you've trained them on a piece of equipment, that's human resources and training. Procurement and inventory, have you bought things for the research group? Have you um, ensured that we have all what we need for the, for the research group? Risk management, if you have an advisor, a PI, then you definitely have worked in risk management. Um, but more importantly, there are risks associated with 
human capital, there's risks associated with money, there's risks associated with budgets and, and projects, and of course science itself, depending on the nature of your area of science, has risks. You know, oops, I dropped this uh, infectious disease on the floor, what am I going to do? What safety protocols have I put into place to make sure that nobody gets uh, killed in the lab or hurt? Um, if you've written a grant, you've been involved with sales and marketing. And quite frankly, if you've given a paper, written a paper, given a talk, that's sales and marketing too. You might have even been involved with event management. If you were on the journal club or if you were involved with the colloquium, that's hardly event management. If you've had a PI or an advisor, you've definitely dealt with customer relations and, of course, proposal writing as you've written grants. So these are just some, like a teeny tiny list of some of the business skills that you've gained from studying science that you probably didn't even realize you had. So this is what I wanted to point out to you, that you actually have this whole vista of things that you can offer companies and organizations that go beyond the technical skills. You also have what are called soft skills, and these include oral and written communications, leadership, team building, diplomacy, conflict resolution. It actually doesn't matter which column you put in here because it's a private document again, and you're going to use this to populate your resume or your CV and your LinkedIn profile and your other marketing documents that you use to get a job. So you could put it in whatever column you want. The point is just identify it. Now, the last, the last column to think about are the characteristics that I learned about myself from these experiences. I learned that I'm very detail oriented. I learned that I'm very results driven. I work well against the deadline. I work well in a really large group where I work really well independently. Write those things down. Remember what it is that you gain from that particular experience, and that's really going to help you. And the last call, the last piece of this skill inventory matrix, or the second to last piece, of course, don't forget, if you are bilingual or trilingual, list that. Remember to put that on your resume, because if you worked in multiple, in, in multiple nations across the planet, that is something that is also very desired by industry and by non-academic, even academia, it's, it's, it's prized because you're going to be working on multicultural, multinational groups. But in particular within industry, as they expand, as they expand their companies across the globe, to be able to say that I speak this language and I worked in this country or I worked on three different continents in four different cultures, that really gives you a competitive advantage as well. So don't forget to, to put that down. Remember what it is that you speak and put it on your resume if it's still appropriate. In other words, if, you, if it's been 10 years since you last spoke Spanish and you would not be able to keep a conversation, then you don't put it down anymore. But that's why we keep the skill inventory matrix to remind yourselves, oh yeah, I did study Spanish, I was fluent in Spanish, and now I'm looking at a company that is looking to move into the Latin American market. Hey, now I can reinvent or, or reestablish my expertise in Spanish by taking some classes or doing some, uh, some online learning so I can re recall my Spanish and then actually deploy it if I was to take this position. There are actually two other columns here that are hidden, but because you're the best audience in the world ever, I'm going to tell you what they are. The hidden columns for the skill inventory matrix are the love column and the hate column. So when you look at the different experiences that you had, what did you love, 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 right? We're thinking about our first job, what kinds of playgrounds would we really enjoy working in or really enjoy playing in? So think about what you loved about that particular experience, and that will help you to start thinking about what types of jobs would be good for you and what types of ecosystems would be good for you. And then the hate column is, what did I hate? What did I loathe? What if I had a choice between doing that task or using that particular skill versus sticking a fork in my eyeball? If I had the choice between the task and the fork in the eyeball, and I chose the fork in the eyeball every single time, then that task should be listed under the hate column. And we're going to list that because as a physical science major, as a person who has a physical science degree, and more broadly somebody who has a STEM background, you have infinite possibilities. So we need to put some borders on that. And the way we put some borders, just one way, is to think about what would we never ever want to do again. And it could be something as simple as I never want to use this particular computing language again because it sucks, or I hated using this computer language because of its, you know, because of X, Y, and Z reasons. Or maybe you choose that maybe you think about, you know what, I hated not being in an office where I had a window. It can be very granulistic because this is your life we're talking about. So we have to be honest with ourselves and think about what we love and what we hate so we can start thinking about where the opportunities lie. The other task that you can do to really move your career forward is to do what's called a SWOT analysis. This is typically a tool that we see in marketing 
and SWOT stands for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. So strengths and weaknesses are intrinsic to us. Opportunities and threats are extrinsic. So from our skill inventory matrix, we will start identifying strengths and we will also start identifying weaknesses. We will see gaps in the skill inventory matrix of weaknesses that may exist within our own skill set. And they are important to mention because say I want to go work for this company and this type of company really wants somebody who knows X, Y, and Z. And from my own skill in inventory matrix, I've been able to see that I've been doing X for 10 years and I've been doing Y on and off for five years, but I've never had experience with Z. So that's an example of a weakness that you can list down. And then for opportunities, the opportunities are going to come as you start networking, as you start researching different ecosystems, and also as you start thinking about what you enjoy, right? So I really enjoyed using X skill. I really enjoyed working or, you know, playing in this type of in Y type of ecosystem. And I'm going to put that down. Even if I don't know what the official name is of the sector, I'm going to write down the opportunity. The threat is what could potentially cause me not to be able to pursue this opportunity. And a threat could be a positive thing or it could be a negative thing. A great example of a threat is this. Let's say your, your dream job is to be an astronaut. You literally want to be an astronaut. Well, you know what? There aren't that many astronaut jobs out there. Maybe one every few years. Highly competitive. It's a worldwide marketplace that's competing for that particular job. So that would be one threat, the, the, chance, the, the idea that there's not that many jobs uh, that are astronaut jobs. Number two, the second threat to that would be that there's a highly competitive marketplace buying for those jobs. Number three, a potential threat to you getting that astronaut job would be the following. Let's say you love New Jersey. You absolutely love New Jersey. That's where you're from. That's where your, your peeps are. I can say that because that's where I'm from. That's where my peeps are. They're in New Jersey. And let's say you do not want to move from New Jersey, or maybe you need not to move from New Jersey because maybe your family is there. Maybe you've made it in your mind that that is a need. I need to stay in New Jersey. Well, there aren't that many astronaut jobs in New Jersey, so that would be a threat to that type of opportunity, too. So we're going to think about it from an economic standpoint. We're going to think about it from a competitive marketplace standpoint. We're going to think about it from a familial standpoint, from a geographic standpoint. And we're going to be honest with ourselves about what those potential threats are. Then I need to ask, is there anything else that I need if I'm going to move forward with this plan? Is there a particular certificate program I could take, an online course? Again, using that example of language capability, let's say you are an expert, or not an expert, but let's say you do have that Spanish language ability, but you haven't used it in a few years. This would be the time to really brush up on your Spanish, and maybe through an online course, or maybe through just a meetup, you know, through meetup.com in your local area, getting together with, uh, like once a week with a Spanish language group, a group of people who only speak Spanish in the group specifically to improve skills in that language, that would be something that would be useful for you to help you move forward, especially if you wanted to move into the Latin American market or into a market that is highlighted or is, is focusing in on Spanish speakers. And maybe there's a short-term project that I could do very quickly, you know, maybe within two to three weeks or maybe even a month that would give me certain experience and certain skills that would allow me to move forward in the direction that I want. So these are the questions that we're going to ask. Maybe these, this need could be accomplished by an internship. Or, quite frankly, maybe it could be accomplished by something even more simply, an informational interview or an informal conversation with somebody with whom I've networked. You know, somebody that I could, maybe an alum of my university, maybe somebody who I've met at a conference that I could email and say, you know, I'm really interested in this type of career path. Would it be possible to talk informally with you? I'd like to learn a little bit more about how I might be able to access this type of career and what skills would be useful for me to hone right now if I wanted to go into this type of job. So these, this information might not have to be accomplished by a, an actual project or an internship. It might be just a conversation that you learn this information from. Number three. Step three is knowing who desires you. And this is really important, right? I want you to know that you are desired. You are loved. You are treasured by many, 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 many different types of sectors. The sectors that you see in front of you right now, all of these different sectors, come from a column that I've been writing for about eight years now for the American Physical Society uh, for their APS, uh, APS News, which is their online newsletter. So I write a column called Profiles and Versatility which is about physicists in quote unquote non-traditional careers. And so I, I highlight physicists who are working in many, many different industries, 
places that I didn't even expect to find physicists, but actually did. And so these li this list that you see in front of you is actually the list of all of the different companies and all, or, or, or sectors and industries that employ people with physics degrees and physics backgrounds. This is meant to just give you a sample, just a little bit of a taste of the diversity of industries that desire you, they want you. So they want the physical scientists more broadly, they want STEM professionals. Who would have thought that you could go into, you know, oil and gas with a physics degree or go into food? You know, there's a physicist that I profiled who worked for Campbell Soup and he was developing all sorts of innovations to make the plant where they make the mushroom soup more um, optimized and, and make it more efficient. And in, in doing so, the problems were interesting. It was another type of playground for him to use his physics knowledge in. It was a brand new type of playground and he had a fabulous time. Uh, but I've talked to physicists who work in forensic, so forensics, who work in art restoration, who work in international development and aid, and who build com consumer products. For example, Procter & Gamble has a physicist who works for their, um, their shaving division, as you can imagine. So they have blades in which you use to shave your face or your legs or your back. And those blades are actually some of the sharpest knives on the planet. So thank goodness there's a physicist who is look, running over, running the show, looking at these blades, how to reduce friction, do, looking at material science, how can we make these better, and actually looking at the thin films that are applied to the blades to make them more efficient and, and cost effective as well. And so those are that's where a physicist is working too. So this is just an example of the fact, these, this list is just a sampling of all of the different types of, just a sum of the different types of sectors that really look for people with a, with a STEM background, with somebody who has a broad-based experience and, and background in problem solving and the ability to apply it elsewhere. So we're going to be entrepreneurial. Again, we're going to think about where else could we potentially do uh, our work? Where else could we potentially find our uh, new playground? And if we know of an opportunity, if we hear of an opportunity, whether it's a job or if it's just a con an opportunity to have a conversation with somebody, you know, if you meet Elon Musk at a conference, uh, or if you see him walking down the hall at a conference, grab it. Grab it now, this second, because most opportunities are fleeting. And I can tell you, and many of you have heard this story before, but I can tell you, I saw, you know, I actually ended up interviewing Elon Musk, and I interviewed him because I was persistent. I just asked for it. I reached out to his PR department for Tesla and SpaceX. I emailed five people in the PR department. I said, I'd like to interview Elon Musk. Five of them said no. And a year later, I emailed 25 of them or something like that. And five of them said no again. And the sixth one said maybe. And I said, well, let me talk to you about it. And we did. And we, I pitched it to him. And I told him what I could do for him, which is being entrepreneurial, right? It's not just me trying to get something out of them. It's not me trying to get a job out of you, but it's me trying to show you how I could solve your problems. What can I potentially do to move your mission forward? And that was how I pitched it to the PR people at Tesla and SpaceX. And that's why, in the end, they said, yes, let's do it. And so Elon Musk actually called me on one day, and I, we did an interview, I, and I wrote an article about him. So if you see an opportunity to talk to somebody, to interview somebody, to have a conversation with somebody, or if you hear of a job opening, or if you hear that a department or a, universe, or a, uh, a company or an enterprise is about to just get a government grant, or maybe they just landed a contract, or maybe they're about to build capacity, and they don't have a job advertised yet, but you know that you would be a good fit. You would be able to fill that need of whatever need they have, even if they haven't advertised it, go for it. Ask for the opportunity. Look for opportunities where other, people's, other people just see walls and you will be able to find an opportunity. You'll be able to make an opportunity. You might just end up creating your own job, which is what I did. You may end up creating your own job and create a revolution. It's really extraordinary. That's how powerful you are. So what we're going to do to know exactly who desires us, because it's important to know who wants us, is we're going to do some research. We're going to review job boards. We're going to research organizations and positions. Take a look at the trends that are happening. We're going to do Google News searches. This is important, not just Google searches, but Google News searches for organizations to find out what's happening and what's being said in the media about different organizations and companies and departments. And we're going to conduct informational interviews to find out more about the culture of those organizations, the opportunities that might exist, and to even perhaps create an opportunity right there on the spot. Okay. 
So the part of step three also, and this is really great, um, this, this uh, toolbox I want to draw your attention to. The careers toolbox for undergraduate physics students is something that AIP and SPS National put together. You can access it for free online. I put the word undergraduate in parentheses because anybody who's in physics could actually use this. Quite frankly, anybody in STEM could use this careers toolbox. It's that universal. The concepts are very, are very universal, although some of the job titles and salary data is specific to physics, but I think you could still find it helpful. And with this toolbox online, you can explore jobs and careers and job titles, salary data that's up to, up to date about what types of salary you could expect, what types of salaries you could expect in different sectors. You can assess what skills you have, so working in concert with that skill inventory matrix. You can learn some very specific, effective job search techniques and even track your progress. It's really amazing, so take advantage of that resource. It's free. So step four, I'm going to organize my marketing materials. So when I say marketing materials, I need any material, any sort of uh, anything that is going to market me to a potential employer. So I need to get that ready to go. So first of all, I need to get my brand statement or my elevator pitch ready. So if I meet somebody at a mixer or if I meet somebody at a conference or if I'm emailing somebody or say I'm just working at Starbucks and somebody comes up to me and says, you know, hey, what's going on? And I tell them a little bit about my background in physics. I'm going to have multiple versions of my brand statement ready for multiple audiences. And my brand statement is, what is it that I'm valuable? What, it is, what is my promise of value? My promise of value, my brand, is my promise to deliver excellence, dependability, and expertise in whatever it is that you're, that you're in, whatever field you're in. And so you want to be able to share with people all these skills and problem-solving abilities and expertise and your credentials and your pedigree and certificates and all that stuff comes into a ball which becomes the brand statement or the elevator pitch or the 30-second commercial, whatever you want to call it, which you would deliver to somebody when you're talking with them. And like I said, you want to have multiple audiences because some audiences are going to be people who are in physics. Some people are going to be in STEM but not physics. Some people are going to be STEM enthusiasts and but not necessarily have a STEM background. For example, human resources professionals and companies, they don't necessarily have a STEM background, but you have to be able to explain to them what value you could provide for their company. So that's an example of a unique value statement that you would be giving to that person that would be different if you were talking to a room full of people that have a physics degree in your area of expertise. Your, so these are, these are your marketing materials. So you also are going to need a resume. Depending on the type of job you're going for, you might also need a CV. You might need both. Uh, you're going to need a cover letter that's going to have multiple versions of it because we're going to customize our cover letter whenever we actually apply for a job. We're going to have a cold email sort of template ready to go that could be, uh, again, customized when we're reaching out to somebody that we don't know and we want to have an informal conversation or informational interview with them. This is what we're going to say. We're going to have a business card which simply says Elena G. Levine, so your name, not my name, but your name, Elena G. Levine. Candidate, PhD, Physics, University of Arizona, maybe three areas of my subspecialty, my email address, my phone number, and my LinkedIn profile, and that's all. You don't have to put a picture of yourself because you're not a real estate agent. You don't have to put a picture of anything else. You don't have to have a logo. It can be simply words. And what I recommend is, especially for those of you that are early in your career, you're about to look for your first job, go out, buy the paper from Staples or whatever where you can print your own business card so you don't have to print, have have them um, formally printed by a printing shop. You can print them yourself and print them in small batches so that if you're going to an event that's specifically focused on you know, the, uh, you know, the oil and gas industry and that's what you really would like to do, your business card can be customized for that particular industry. And you can put on your business card some very specific skills that you know from your informational interviews that the oil and gas industry is looking for. Whereas if you're going to the APS March meeting, it's a little bit more broad and your business card could say something different. So print out small batches that are customizable. And then, of course, we're going to organize our LinkedIn profile. I'm going to talk to you more about that. And we're going to invest in some appropriate professional clothing that will be used for not only job interviews, but in, in, uh, environments in which we are going to have a spotlight on us and maybe going to a conference, for example, maybe going out to dinner with a colloquium speaker, that sort of thing. We want to be seen as serious about our craft, which is simply being professional. So we're going to invest in clothes. And that could mean spending 20 bucks at a thrift store. You don't have to spend 500 bucks 
on a suit. It's not necessary. You can spend 20 bucks or you can just put together a nice outfit that you have in your home, maybe a nice pair of chinos that are ironed, a nice skirt if you're a lady, a nice blouse or a shirt, and maybe a jacket. You know, but we're going to leave our hiking boots at home, we're going to leave our jeans at home, we're going to leave our t-shirts at home when we go for, for job interviews and when we're in environments where decision makers are congregating. Then we're also going to tidy up our online presence. And just like when you are going to sell your house, you're not going to put up the for sale sign until you actually clean out your tub and, and put all the nice landscaping, clean up the front of the house, the inside of the house, everything. It has to be tidied up before you put a for sale sign. Just like that, before we start job searching, we have to tidy up our online presence. We go on the caveat that cyberspace is forever space, as my mother says. Very important. So anything that you have up there is there to be there forever. But what we can do to mitigate any risk associated with those pictures that you drunk when you went on spring break or, or in, you know, potential jokes that you made that could be taken the wrong way on your Facebook page, we're going to get rid of. So we're going to start deleting things. We're going to start clearing out our Facebook and our Facebook accounts and other social media accounts, maybe even our blog of things that could be potentially incriminating. Because even though you might have it as private, you know, you have the privacy control set so only you and your 50 close friends can see it. The fact of the matter is, is if it's online, it could be potentially shared. And we want to make sure that when any somebody, whenever somebody comes in contact with your brand in cyberspace, that all they think of is your brilliance, your talent, what an asset you'd be to the organization. So we're going to, on our LinkedIn profile, we're going to change our title. We're going to have a headline that describes who we are and what we're looking for and what we can do for our uh, potential organization for our potential employer, and we're going to add a professional photo. So it's again, it's not you upside down, uh, you know, drunk in Cabo. It's you looking professional, smiling, happy. Remember, this is a happy endeavor, and I want to be able to see your eyes in your photo. So we're going to incorporate our brand, which is our promise of value and keyword skills, into our online presence. We're going to list our successes, our accomplishments, because this is not bragging. In fact, I want you to remove that word from your brain. Uh, literally lobotomize the part of your brain that has the word brag in it because it is not what we are talking about. We are talking about appropriate self-promotion that is important for me as an employer to know. If you got a grant, if you did X, if you learned this skill, or if you speak Spanish, or if you had the best uh, business plan in the, in the technical business plan competition, or if you got the Nobel Prize, let me freaking know. Tell me on your LinkedIn profile. Tell me on your different places that this is who you are because this is very, very important information for me to know. It sets you apart from the competition. It engages me and wants me to learn more about you. And remember to ask yourself on all of your different online uh, social media platforms, if somebody wanted, me to wanted to find me for X and Y skill or experience, would they be able to? So don't you just do a search for yourself, but have your friends do a search for X and Y and see if your name even comes up. Step six is now we're going to look for opportunities to demonstrate our brand. And I call these reputation amplification activities. This is where we actually get to show the world what we are, who we are, what we could do for them, and really shine a spotlight on our value and how we would be an asset to the organization. So some classic examples that we see in academia are speaking, for example, speaking at conferences or regionally based chapters or sections or student organizations, business organizations within your local geography, mixers that happen at the conference or mixers that happen within the university or the institution or the geography, writing, and I don't just mean journal papers, write articles for your association newsletter, write articles for your institutional newspaper, uh, consider writing an op-ed for your local newspaper so that people get a chance to see you out there talking and speaking about your expertise. Volunteer to be on committees for your professional association. Volunteer to drive the colloquium speaker to the airport. I've known numerous people who've done that, and they've gotten jobs out of that because they had that private face time, and the colloquium speaker really appreciates that you took the time to drive them to the airport. While traveling, volunteer to give talks at your alma mater or attend alumni mixers. And I know of a scientist who, every time she went back home, uh, to Greece, in fact, that's where she was from, she volunteered to give talks at her 
uh, her, the university that she graduated from. And then she started giving talks in other departments at the university. And then she found out and they found out other universities heard about her. And when she'd come home on holiday, they'd invite her to give talks at those other universities. And by the time she finished her postdoc, she had a job lined up for her in Greece, which is where she wanted to be. So these things, when you're traveling, really leveraging that experience to give talks and, and interact with people is very important. We're going to engage, and this is step seven, we're going to engage in what I call high-impact networking. I just want to quickly give you a definition of networking because a lot of people think that networking is me trying to extract something from you. It's me trying to get a job from you. Okay, and it's not, Matt, it's not that at all. It's not me trying to get something from you. It's actually me trying to give you something. It's me trying to contribute something to you. So networking is a spectrum of activities that begins with that first interaction that we have. And maybe it's from meeting me at a conference, or maybe you reached out to me because you saw that I wrote an op-ed, or maybe you reached out to me because I'm a member of this association and you saw me listed in the membership directory, or maybe I mentioned something on LinkedIn and you reached out to me. It aims for a win-win, mutually beneficial partnership where you and I are both going to be providing value to each other over the course of the time of our engagement. And that could be in many different forms. It could be that one day I provide you with information or I give you guidance as to how to get a job in this field. Maybe you tell me about an article that would be of interest to me for the type of research that I'm doing. Maybe I tell you about my brother-in-law at, at, uh, at Microsoft who's looking to hire people with your background. Maybe one day I actually say, would you be interested in joining our team? So it's various correspondence, but it's all about what value can we each provide to each other, and it ends only when one or both of us drop dead. That is networking. So it's not me drilling for oil from you, and it's also not a sleazy endeavor of me trying to, you know, sell you a used car. I'm not trying to pull one over on you. I'm trying to find out what are your problems, because I want to see how I can help solve them. I want to see how I can help move your mission forward. And when you approach job searching with that mindset, that when you interact with potential employers or potential decision makers, and you ask them questions about what it is that they're working on, and you include in that, in that conversation examples of things that you've done, and you say, you know, I think I might be able to assist you with that. I have done X and Y. In fact, here's an example of me doing X and Y in a project. What you're doing is you're actually making, you're providing me with value because you're helping me to solve a problem. One of the problems I have is I need to hire somebody who can do X and Y, and you've now just told me that you can do X and Y, and you've offered that to me. So that idea of offering and contributing to the other person's success and their organization's success is what I mean by high-impact networking. And as you can see, that's, there's nothing sleazy about that. That's actually very gracious and is actually how people get jobs. In particular, networking is the only way to access hidden opportunities. Uh, opportunities that don't exist. They don't exist because they haven't come into fruition yet because I haven't had a conversation with you. Or maybe they've just opened and now I'm going to, I've just advertised it, but because I've talked with you, I've networked with you, and I've learned that you do X and Y, I'm going to invite you to apply. Or maybe I'm just going to close the advertisement altogether and bring you in for an interview. Maybe it's a, a job, like I said, that doesn't exist until you and I start talking. And I say, you know, I really need somebody who does X, Y, and speaks Spanish. And you tell me, you know what, Elena, I don't think you realize this, but not only do I speak X and Y, but I studied abroad in Spain. I speak fluent Spanish. I'd be happy to help you with that. The opportunity has now come to an, into an existence because you and I have had a conversation. That's the type of high-impact networking that we want to think about because that's where we can actually create jobs for ourselves. So we're looking to network with people who are decision makers for advertised positions and then people who know decision makers for these opportunities and people who are decision makers for hidden positions that don't even exist or could potentially exist once they get to know how brilliant you are. We're looking for to, to, in, to in, um, invest in and to interact with or to um, engage, excuse me, in high impact networking. We need to find what I call networking nodes. And networking node is anything or person or place that congregates and aggregates people in a like-minded industry or like-minded field. So a, a great example of a networking node is a conference. Uh, it could be a professional society. That's a, definitely a networking node. It could be a particular event. A person could be a networking node, like you see this a lot on LinkedIn. So the idea is we look for networking nodes because then we have a great optimization 
problem that we can easily solve because suddenly there's a lot of people in the same industry or in the same field congregating, aggregating nearby, either virtually or, or in the real world, like at a physical conference, and we can start networking with them. But we also want to ask our trusted mentors and contacts for referrals. Who do they know in this industry, this company, this career path that I can speak with? We're going to seek out fellow alumni and friends, uh, friends of friends. We're going to reach out to the directories of our professional societies. And what I mean by that is if I'm a member of Society X, I've listed my contact information in that directory. I didn't do it for my health. I did it for networking purposes. I want to network with people, even early career professionals like yourselves. So I'm putting my contact information there so you can contact me. And you should definitely leverage that opportunity. And then also reach out to technical leaders, so leaders in technology within industry clusters. And industry clusters, a great example of an industry cluster is Boston, where there's a lot of biotech, or New Jersey, where there's a lot of pharmaceutical companies, or of course, Silicon Valley, or where I live, Tucson, Arizona, it's called the optics cluster because there are a lot of optics companies here. So an industry cluster is a critical mass of companies in a like-minded industry all in the same geographic region. The geography is the important piece there. So what you have is all these companies that are related to, for example, optics, all in the Tucson Basin. And that's, this means that there's a lot of job opportunities in optics. It means that the, the, the community, the economic development professionals in Tucson are invested and are very are very concerned about keeping those companies healthy and happy because it increases the tax base. And this means that this gives you a chance to find out about opportunities and to network with a large number of people in that particular sector. And when you reach out to the industry clusters, which have their own professional societies, you can find out about, you get insight about opportunities that are up and coming, opportunities that are about to open, opportunities that are going to be coming down the pike, and um, you can interact with and meet with decision makers to create your own opportunities. They're really great. So with high impact networking, we're aiming for a win-win on the long term, but we're also aiming for a short term aim because quite frankly, a win-win short term aim, quite frankly, we need a job, right? That's why you're attending this webinar today. So how do we leverage our high impact networking in such a way that we're not drilling for oil from the person, but they do recognize that we are looking for a job. And it goes back to that idea of how can I, job seeker, how can I help you solve your problems. What can I do for you? Perhaps there's a way we can collaborate or maybe write a grant proposal or write a paper together or maybe I can assist you in this particular project. And that's what you want to do. How can I help you? That should be at the forefront of your mind and that's where you get access to opportunities. So we're going to ask for informal conversations and the type of questions that we're going to ask during these informal conversations or informational interviews are things like what type of opportunities are available for somebody with my expertise. You know, or you can share that I've, I've researched your company. That's important. Tell me a little bit about myself. I'm excited about your company because of X and Y, because of this new product that you've just developed. What kind of projects would I be able to engage in in X and Y? Or would I be able to work on this team, on this particular product, or this particular uh, department, or this particular research area? How can I best prepare for an opportunity at your company? What skills do you especially look for but don't often see in candidates? These are questions that you can ask, and people will be very responsive to that. Now, we also want to be thinking about LinkedIn and utilizing social media as our, and using, utilizing LinkedIn as, a, as a, the main area of our social media engagement. Yes, you can be on Facebook, and Facebook groups are very helpful, but LinkedIn is actually where the most value you're going to get. You're going to get the most value and the biggest return on your time, the biggest return on your investment in terms of engaging people to get you a job. So I want you to be thinking about using LinkedIn to be able to get you a job, to interact with people, to meet with people, to make opportunities, and to find out about opportunities. I want to go back to this um, graphic for a moment. And this is produced by Wayne Bright Bart of the company Power Plus Formula. He did a uh, he did a research on which of the following LinkedIn features have you found to be helpful from a group of people. And you can go to his website, Power Plus Formula, and you'll get the whole graphic. It's very, very interesting. And what he found on LinkedIn was that 75% or 76% of the uh, respondents to his survey said that the, the um, feature, who's viewed your profile, that's a feature on LinkedIn, who's viewed your profile, 
75% of the respondents found that to be helpful in getting their next job, in finding connections to get their next job. Um, they also found helpful, take a look at this, people who they may know, that's a feature that the, the, the algorithm that runs LinkedIn pops up, it'll say people you may know, uh, you can direct message people, you can search for companies, you can do advanced people searching, and this one right here, this, this one down here where it says hosting and participating in group discussions, um, I'm going to try and highlight it for you in case you can't see it. Um, this thing right here, this is so, I'm sorry, I'm like highlighting it all over it, but you'll see what I'm saying. This is so important because this actually shows you um, what, this actually gives you a lot of return on your investment because it highlights you to potential people who are all interested in the same thing that you're interested in. So in his survey, only 42% found it helpful. I actually have found it to be much higher than that. So, but I just wanted you to see that. You can go to his website, like I said, and you'll get more information. It's really, really interesting. Okay, so let me go back. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to consider investing in LinkedIn Premium in the early stages of our job search, or late stages. LinkedIn Premium is, I think, about $50 a month. You can get LinkedIn for free. But what LinkedIn Premium does is it acts, it gives you a lot more uh, access to a lot more features. And in particular, the Who's Viewed My Profile feature gives you access to anybody who is, it shows you anybody who has viewed your profile versus only a small snapshot of that. This has actually helped people that I know get jobs. Because I, let's say I'm on LinkedIn and I look at who's viewed my profile and I see Mary X has viewed my profile from company Y. Well, now I have a reason to contact Mary X because she viewed my profile. So I send her a message via LinkedIn and I say, hi, Mary, I saw you looked at my profile. I looked at yours. I think there might be an opportunity to collaborate or I'd like to learn how I might be able to contribute to your organization. Could we have an informal conversation about it? And Mary says, sure, why not? And we do actually have that conversation and it leads to a job. So what I just described to you is not a theoretical construct. It's not unicorns or it's not something fake like climate change. That's my joke. That's my joke. Okay, it's real, okay, like dinosaurs and humans playing together. It's something that people have actually used to get jobs. That's how important the Who's Viewed My Profile feature is on LinkedIn. So when you invest in LinkedIn Premium, let's say you do it for just a couple of months as you're getting ready to graduate or you're about to graduate, this might be a good use of your money because you'll get a full view of who has viewed your profile and you'll have a reason to contact them. You're going to be active in relevant groups. You're going to observe what's happening, see who is a member of the group, and then start contributing to the group discussions and connect with people in the group. You're going to use the Find Alumni tab. That's another really rich feature of LinkedIn to find alumni in my, from my institution who are worldwide working in different companies and organizations. And I'm going to do keyword searches for jobs and people and organizations. Remember that LinkedIn is a professional marketplace to find connections. It is also an absolutely appropriate ecosystem for self-promotion. So it's totally fine for you on your LinkedIn profile to list that you got the Nobel Prize or to list that you were the number one student in your graduating class. This is important information for me as a decision maker to know. So we're going to use that and we're going to recognize that we can self-promote appropriately. And then the other really important feature on LinkedIn is to ask for recommendations. So you can ask other LinkedIn users to recommend you and then your recommendation with their name connected to their profile will appear on your profile. And that's a really legitimate way of showing the public that people really find you to be very, very high quality, very somebody that they should be looking into. Step nine is we're going to take advantage of our own institutional career resources, our own career center at our institution, whether it's a university or if we're doing a postdoc or graduate uh, degree within a government lab, they probably have, or an agency, they probably have some sort of career center. We're going to leverage our connections with our mentors, our fellow students, our postdocs, our former postdocs, former students. We're going to go to campus, on, on campus institutional events and take a look at the calendar for the last year. You know, if you did not attend the event when, for example, Raytheon came and, you know, gave a talk, you know, maybe in the physics department, you'll see who spoke You'll see what his name was and maybe even what his email address is or you could get it from the department and you could reach out to him and say, you know, unfortunately I didn't attend my colloquium because I had class at that time, but I'd love to talk to you about Raytheon and maybe there's something I can do for you. Maybe I can help you and I'd love to learn more about what types of opportunities might be available at Raytheon for somebody like myself at my university. That gives you a networking opening, gives you a networking opportunity. 
You really got to take advantage of our alumni association and our chapters and contact the chapter president when you're traveling in different locations. Um, as I mentioned, we're going to contact local visitors from the past year uh, to have those conversations. And for those of you that are on an institution or in, at an institution that have a postdoc association and, of course, the grad college, they often have a lot of career resources as well, both contacts connections with, with industry, connections with different organizations, um, workshops, professional development opportunities, and things of that nature. And then step 10, ho-ho, we're going to actually apply for jobs. So yes, we're going to be networking. Yes, we're going to be looking for unique ecosystems where we can provide value where nobody else could, or unique places where we can solve problems where other people can't. But we're also going to be proactive, and we're going to take advantage of all of our resources so if you see jobs that are advertised that sound really awesome, apply for them. Keep track of them. So we're going to also upload our resume onto job boards in our field, particularly within our professional societies, because decision makers are constantly looking on those job boards to see whether or not they want to invite somebody to apply for a position. They, that has actually happened to a client of mine. She's a physical oceanographer. She put her resume up on the job board for her professional society and a decision maker from a company that she never even heard of emailed her and said, I saw your resume. Would you be interested in talking about a job in my company? Boom. That's how it happens. Mind blown? You're welcome. We're also going to look to connect with decision makers and company representatives in advance. So once we see a job that's advertised, let's say Raytheon, for example, we're going to reach into our networking networks uh, and we're going to see if we can find somebody who works for Raytheon so we can talk to them ahead of time and find out what is like there and what we could potentially do to improve our chances and improve our applications. And we're going to also ask friends and colleagues and PIs and advisors and family if they know of any opportunities. We're going to use all of our bases. Step 11, this is the final step and this is the most important step. We're not going to give up your dream job and quite frankly there's probably multiple dream jobs that you want your dream career, and quite frankly, there's multiple dream careers that you want, they're out there. They may not exist yet. You may not even have a title for it yet, but they are out there. And the idea is we're not going to give up. We're going to keep going. We're going to keep track of our progress. We're going to keep looking for opportunities, keep looking for opportunities where we can uniquely solve problems where others can't. We're going to look for opportunities where others see walls and we see ways of getting through the wall, getting to the other side of the wall, demolishing the wall, and so on and so forth. And we're going to know that even if the first job that we have is not our dream job, or it doesn't appear to be, sometimes it actually is, but it doesn't appear to be at first our dream job, we're going to know that every experience that we have, including our first job, will prepare us for the next even better opportunity. So we're going to not give up. Our astronaut job is out there. We're going to get it, and we're going to keep going until we don't, until we get to that playground and we can play with those, those toys. And then once we play with those toys, we might look to our right and see that there's another playground that we didn't even realize that's bigger and better and has even shinier toys. And then from there, we might even find another playground or we might even create our own playground. This is what I have done in my own career, in my own multiple careers. This is what is in store for you with your STEM degrees. So that's why I'm so excited because you really have a lot of opportunities even if we are down to the wire. We're down to the edge of when you're going to be graduating. There are still these 10 plus things that you can do, including not giving up, to move your career forward and get that job that you want. So I want to leave you here with a couple of resources. First of all, that careers toolbox, very, very useful. Take a look at that. Again, it's a free opportunity that was created just for you. So really take advantage of that. And I also wrote a column. I write a career column for physics today on, on lots of career issues, and I wrote a column Called land that first job now. Many of the principles we talked about today are in that, so you can take a look at that if you want. Um, we have a survey, and I'll be sending you an email with the survey URL as well, but please fill out the survey. Let us know. Let the AIP Career Network that this is the type of experience that you're interested, that you find valuable. And finally, we have upcoming webinars. We're going to be doing two webinars in the fall, one on identifying and seizing value from conference participation and transitioning your career beyond academia. So save the dates because those will be coming up and I'm really excited about that. So I want to thank you so much. I want to thank you very much for this opportunity to present to you about how to get that first job, how to get that dream job, how to think about getting a job as you're graduating. I truly am excited for you. I'm not, 
I'm not a sad Elena. I'm a happy Elena because the, the, the opportunities that are out there and the opportunities that you will create from your networking and from your co collaborations are going to bring you a lot of pleasure in your life, and I'm, I'm really thrilled about that. So thank you so much for the opportunity to present today, and I want to thank, again, also our sponsors today, the AIP Career Network and all of those organizations right there on your screen that are there to help you. So I'm going to take a few questions now, and then, um, we'll be, uh, like I said, I'll be sending you a follow-up email with some resources, which I think will be useful. So a couple of people had some really great questions here. So I graduated last August and haven't been able to go find a job. Should I look for other jobs that are not of my interest? And I would say that's a great question, and I would say, yes, absolutely, you should be doing that. Um, you should be looking for jobs that are not in your interest because, quite frankly, if you're without a job for that long, you do need, to, you need money, so you do need to get a job. And even if the job is in an industry or in a sector or it's working in a different type of playground that wasn't what you envisioned, that experience could potentially be leveraged into something else. For example, let's say you got a job at a company in the purchasing department, right? You studied STEM, which stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math, and you're doing purchasing. Well, once you're in the company, you can laterally move within the company, and you can also laterally move within the industry. So there's opportunities, even if the job is not in your field, once you're in an organization, and once you prove to that organization that you're valuable. So I would definitely look for other opportunities if you haven't found that, that dream job or that, that job within your interest, and, and see what else you can do, and see how you can really do your best work in that position, and then leverage the position to be even more productive, to shine more brightly, and to get opportunities in your field. Um, somebody asked, does an interim job after a PhD, uh, is this a for, is this like, what, when I said doing an interim job after a PhD, was I meaning something that you do for free or something like a postdoc? And I mean any of the above. Anything that could potentially give you experience is what I was referring to. Somebody asked me about the salary for certain, uh, for certain sectors. Somebody in particular wanted to know what the salary is for an electrical engineer. And there's a really great resource that you can use. Um, this is for a, na it's a national database, but it's also, well, first of all, the, the careers, I'm going to go back for a second, the, um, the toolbox here actually gives you all this lot of salary data that is very useful for you, for people with a physics degree and also in the um, engineering and other physical sciences. But the United States Bureau of Labor Statistics, United States Bureau of Labor Statistics, and you can Google that, has salary data for all sorts of different jobs in all sorts of different sectors. And websites like salary.com, indeed.com, and even like Career Builder probably too, all have lots of data about salaries that you can take a look at. So um, th that's something that you can look into. So somebody said, um, I did my master's in physics uh, about 10 years ago, and then I worked in education as a teacher and an educator, but my interest area is still research. I'm in my early 30s, I have two kids, do I still have a chance to pursue my life's main goal, which is research? And the answer is absolutely, and the idea, the way you would do this is to start networking with people in research, people who do research in academia, people who do research in government labs and agencies and non, in non-governmental organizations, as well as in, um, in companies in academia too. So. It, you don't have to close the door. You don't have to give up your dream if it's been a few years since you've done what you consider to be your dream. You can always start contacting people, seeing what you could do in the position that you're in right now. How could you potentially help them? Maybe there's something you could do. Maybe you could help them develop curriculum. Maybe you could help them in, you know, by teaching a class, or maybe you could help them by developing um, a new uh, you know, a pedagogical method that they could use in class, in which case they would learn a little bit more about your background in physics and as a researcher, and you might be able to create an opportunity for yourself where you're doing research, even if it's just part-time or maybe as a consulting opportunity. So don't give up that offer. Don't give up that, that desire that you have just because it's been a while or because you don't find that particular position right away. You can always go back. It's not easy. I'm not going to say it's like, you know, simple or easy. But I am going to say that it's definitely feasible, but the way you do it is via networking. Networking is the way you're going to do it. Um, somebody asked if we have worked in two very divergent fields, one pertaining to physics and the other one having nothing to do with STEM, is it still worth listing both on LinkedIn? And that's a really great question, and I think it is. I think that you should because, you know, especially if it's something 
like art, for example, or performing arts, or maybe you have a hobby where you, um, you know, disassemble and assemble car engines, or maybe you really enjoy, uh, maybe you're not a geologist, but you really are a rock hound and you really love geology, but that's not associated with your education. I think anything that can distinguish you is useful to put on LinkedIn because, you know, after a while as a decision maker, if I'm looking for somebody with a physics degree or I'm looking for somebody with a medical physics degree for a job and I look for, I search on LinkedIn for potential candidates, you know, there's going to be tons and tons of candidates that are all going to look basically the same. Everybody's going to have this type of education. Maybe they've done a couple of uh, short-term projects or research projects or internships where they've gained the same type of experience. But if I see somebody who's done something unique, like performing arts or art or graphic design, for example, and somebody did just ask me about this particular issue of just two days ago. This is going to distinguish you. So here was the example that this person gave, right? So this, I was at a chemical engineering conference and somebody said, I'm a chemical engineer. I have chemical engineering background, but I also got a, my first degree was in the visual arts, was in graphic design. Should I even mention that on my resume and on my LinkedIn profile when I'm applying for chemical engineering positions? The answer is absolutely, because not only does it distinguish you, but it does provide you with another skill set that could be very useful in chemical engineering, right? Including product design, you see things from an aesthetic point of view, whereas others might. And there's other skills that you gain from doing graphic design and visual design that somebody with just a STEM or an engineering or science background is not necessarily going to have or be as experienced in. So that gives you a real competitive advantage. So in answer to your question on this webinar about whether or not you should have, these, when, when you have these two divergent fields, physics and something else that's not in STEM, you know, it's up to you whether or not you want to list it, but I think it could potentially be a competitive advantage for you because it'll distinguish you. Uh, so one other question I'll take an answer, I'll take a, a question uh, and because we have tons of questions and then I'll, I'll find a way to answer the rest of these for you. How can we know about or learn about the industry clusters and their location. So this is a really great question about industry clusters. So remember, an industry cluster is a critical mass of companies in a like-minded industry, all in the same geographic area. So quite frankly, the way you could look at it is you could do Google searches on a couple, using a couple of different methods. One method would be, let's say you were very interested in a geography. Let's say you were very interested in Arizona. So you could do industry cluster, Google, industry cluster, Arizona. Or you could go on to the Chamber of Commerce for Tucson or Phoenix, their website. Or you could take a look at, do a Google search for Economic Development Arizona or High Tech Arizona. And you'd be able to find out what are the high tech clusters in Arizona and in particular in Tucson. The other way to do it is to do it from the technology point of view, right? So let's say you were interested in optics. So I would do a search. I don't not necessarily know where I want to go with optics, but I want to know where are the optics clusters. So I could simply do a Google search called optics clusters, or I could go onto websites of optics organizations or organizations that serve the optics industry and see where maybe a majority of the members who work in optics actually live. And I might find that, for example, there is a critical mass of people who work in optics in Rochester. There's a critical mass of people who work in optics in Tucson, then so on and so forth. And this would give me ideas as to where these, these clusters are located. So unfortunately, we're out of time. We have a lot more questions here, and I apologize that I wasn't able to get to everyone's. I'm going to see what I can do, like I said, to find a way to answer those questions for you. But please fill out the survey. Um, I'm going to be sending you information about that. Um, I appreciate you staying with me and staying afterwards to work on this and to, for me to answer any questions for you. And instead of wishing you luck, as I never do because you don't need it, I'm just going to say enjoy the ride because you're in for a really great time. So thank you so much. Thank you for everybody who was here today. Thank you, AIP Career Network. And this concludes our webinar for today. Take care, everybody.